Hey everyone on YouTube, welcome back to my channel. I hope you're doing well and I hope you had a wonderful solstice. Um, no matter what part of the world you're in, yesterday the solstice, which is the summer solstice down where I'm at, was my birthday. And so I just wanted to kind of show off these cool earrings my mother-in-law gave me. They're made of copper and they're in the shape of the hummingbird from the Nazca lines in Peru in that petroglyph kind of cool archaeological site so I had to show those off um, I had an excellent birthday it was also the Jupiter Saturn great conjunction in Aquarius which was really interesting to work with those energies and set some intentions for continuing this process of liberation and the great unfucking, as I've been calling it, the great unfucking of myself, my sense of self, my mental health and emotional well-being from the lingering effects of childhood emotional neglect and psychological and verbal abuse. And so, if you've been following me in the last few videos, probably about four, three or four videos that I've been putting up since the end of November, throughout Sagittarius season, um, I've been sharing uh, tarot spreads, which I'll share a few up here, which might be pertinent to today's video. I've been sharing book reviews. The first book I reviewed was, um, oh, I forgot the name of the author. Hold on. Adult Children of Emotionally Immature Parents, How to Heal from Distant, Rejecting, or Self-Involved Parents by Lindsay Gibson, which I'll link up here in the cards. Then I shared a review of healing, well, Lindsay Gibson's book has more to do with um, the impact of emotional neglect on the child and then the adult child of emotionally immature parents. Um, healing Your Emotional Self, linked up here, a powerful program to help you raise your self-esteem, quiet your inner critic, and overcome your shame by Beverly Angle. That talks about emotional neglect as well, but it also talks about emotional and verbal abuse and the impact that those can have on your um, emotional development, your self-esteem, you know, your toxic inner critic. And she talks about how to overcome that, and I kind of give my thoughts about that book. So today, this is the third out of the four book reviews that I'm sharing. We are talking about Will I Ever Be Good Enough? Healing the Daughters of Narcissistic Mothers by Carol McBride. Um, so before I dive into today's review, I want to give my general caveats, but also talk specifically about this term narcissist and how complicated that term can be. Um, first general caveat, I am in no way, shape, or form a mental health professional. I've just been on the receiving end, right? <laughs> and related to that, caveat number two, I am a person who throughout my childhood and teenage years, didn't really have access to professional mental health care, and also my emotionally neglectful parents didn't even think to take me to a therapist <laughs> when it was obvious that I needed help. Anyway, um, but when I did have access to mental health care, that access has been very um, restrictive and sporadic. And so this series, and one of the main reasons why I'm talking about the books and sharing my thoughts and um, kind of highlighting uh, how these books have helped me is because I know that I'm not alone in this boat. <laughs> I'm not the only person out there that doesn't necessarily, at least at this moment, have access to professional mental health care. And so even though these books are not a replacement of professional mental health care, they can, however, help people who don't have access to that right now. They can still help you if you have not yet dived deep into these problems, if you haven't taken that plunge yet, but you know you are ready to, you know now is the moment to, you know that it's a journey that you would like to 
go on and you would like to work with a therapist someday but you don't have access to that now, these books can still help you get the ball rolling because basically all four of the books that I'm talking about, um, Adult Children of Emotionally Immature Parents, Healing Your Emotional Self, Daughters of Narcissistic Mothers, and Pete Walker's Complex PTSD from Surviving to Thriving, which is the next book review I'm doing, they all helped to, they kind of helped me in two main ways. One, they helped me feel validated. Finally, for the first time in my life, I had names and concepts to apply to my experience and I understood why I was the way that I was and it helps to, that validation helped to liberate me from toxic shame that I had internalized, largely due to my narcissistic mother, <laughs> which I'll get into um, a little bit later in the video. But they also helped me to understand um, what I can do about it on my own. You know, the journaling exercises, the lists of concepts, the ideas for replacing those um, negative core beliefs of your toxic inner critic. It gave me tools so I could finally feel like I, I, had, I had the tools I needed, the basic, basic tools I needed to finally take the reins back in my life and feel validated and liberated enough to work on my own emotional healing, my own, um, my own individuation process, which was stunted by the abuse and neglect, and yeah, go on this journey of the great unfucking. So, um, I hope that these book reviews can help people out there who to get the ball rolling, who are toward the beginning of their journey of unpacking all this bullshit and really take charge of their lives and move forward with their lives. It's, um, it's very sacred, powerful work. Arguably some of the most important work that you can do for yourself. So kudos to you. Um, <laughs> my comrade, <laughs> um, we're, we're on a tough journey, but it's, it's a powerful and it's an important one. So, narcissism, um, this term, I, I have some mixed feelings about using it and applying it to my mother or applying it to the abuse that she put us through. I have mixed feelings because, and this might just be because of the YouTube or the internet algorithms, I don't know, it just seems like there's a plethora, an abundance, maybe even an overabundance of online content about narcissism, like how to tell if your parents were narcissistic, how to tell if your boyfriend or your husband or your wife is narcissistic, what, is this, what are the signs of narcissistic abuse. And there are a lot of mental health professionals that make online content about this, and I'll make a video after talking about the complex PTSD book, I'm going to make a video kind of with a, a list of resources that I have found incredibly helpful. So, and some of those resources are um, YouTube videos and channels made by mental health professionals, but there's also a lot of life coaches that talk about this sort of thing, but there's also a lot of, there's just a lot of content out there, and so I would advise you to proceed with caution, you know, um, practice discernment, you know, when consuming this kind of content, when you click play on that YouTube video about the top top five signs of narcissism or whatever, you know, practice discernment and just be careful because I found, I, I actually found it pretty triggering to watch too many videos about narcissism. I kind of limited the number of videos that I would watch and I just kind of saved on a playlist the videos that I knew that I would like to revisit made by content creators that I trust, you know. And this term narcissism, um, the way that I'm choosing to use it, I am not explicitly connecting it or using it synonymously with 
narcissistic personality disorder, which is something that only a mental health professional can diagnose, right? It has a specific list of diagnostic criteria. It's in the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual that is used by mental health professionals, but also um, health insurance companies, at least in the U.S., <laughs> to diagnose, um, you know, disorders and diseases, right? And then the health insurance companies use that to determine whether or not they're going to give you any coverage, right? Which is a whole, when it comes to complex PTSD and how it's not really officially recognized by the DSM, if I understand that correctly, at least in the U.S., it can't really be used by, or it's not accepted by um, health insurance companies to provide you coverage. There's a, a complicated twisted ball of yarn with complex PTSD and the DSM and health insurance and all of that. Anyway, that aside, I'm not using narcissistic or narcissism or these kind of terms as, a, as synonymous with narcissistic personality disorder, which means I don't know if my mom, I, I don't know what her diagnosis is. Um, I do know throughout my childhood and my teenage years and into my 20s, my mother um, did not or had not received professional help until I was basically more or less in my early to in my mid-20s. Um, I know she was initially diagnosed with bipolar 1, but then a couple, two or three years later, that diagnosis was changed. I don't know to what. I don't know. Um, so it's not my place to diagnose my mother. I don't have the level of expertise to diagnose my mother. However, I do more or less feel comfortable using the term narcissistic to at least describe how her abuse worked and, and the impact it had on me and my sister, if that makes sense. Um, and reading Carol McBride's book really helped me to feel more comfortable with that. Um, you know, understanding the nuances of using the term narcissistic or narcissism understanding how the term can be overused maybe and even abused in general, right? It, it kind of helped me navigate these muddy waters, but I think it's important for me to use the term because it, it, gives, me, um, it gives me a starting place. You know, you, you can't fully grasp the problem until you have a term or a name for the problem. It gives you a starting place, it gives you something that you can use to look up more information about it. It's just a very practical thing for me. But I understand how complicated it is. And I also want to touch on a little bit um, the role of compassion. Because the term narcissism, at least how I've seen it used on the interwebs, um, I feel like the term can sometimes be used in a very accusatory, aggressive, like this person is broken kind of way. And I'm not saying that that's like necessarily a bad thing or always inappropriate, but at least when it comes to me and my mom, <laughs> um, I feel like I still have compassion for her. I understand where she comes from. I understand more or less why she is the way she is and why she was the way she was when we were growing up. I understand that her background is super abusive and shitty. Her parents were super abusive and shitty. Um, that doesn't excuse what she did to us, but it allows me to still have a good amount of compassion for her and so when I use, when I call her a narcissist or I label what she did to us narcissistic abuse, I just want, I always try to remind myself to not use that label as an excuse to dehumanize her, right? I always want to remember her humanity and that's where the... So before we dive into the structure of the book and I highlight uh, some of the thoughts and ideas that really stuck with me and helped me 
I just want to give one little critique, <coughs> excuse me, um, that I have, and this is similar to the critique I had for Healing Your Emotional Self by Beverly Engel in the last book review, and that is just how kind of heteronormative this book is. Um, first, it assumes that you still identify as a woman or female. You know, you could have been labeled female and raised as a daughter at birth, but maybe now you don't identify that way anymore. So there's no mention of non-binary or transgender or anything. Um, also, it's heteronormative in the, in the sense that it, uh, by and large, the author, the way that she writes and the terminology that she uses, she assumes that you're heterosexual and that you're monogamous in your partnerships. There is, however, a very quick mention, like she says something kind of toward the middle, maybe in the second half of the book, you know, everything I'm saying about my partner got a phone call. She says something like, everything I'm saying about how, like, the problems that you might face in your romantic relationships with men as an adult, those can also be applied for same-sex relationships. And it's just a very quick mention, which I do appreciate, but it happens kind of late in the book, and I wish it was something that was brought up or acknowledged more clearly and earlier in the book. Um, so that is something to to consider. But that's really my main critique of the book. Overall, I found it very validating and helpful. Um, yeah, uh, let's dive in. So she has a very quick introduction. And basically the point of the introduction or what I wrote down here in my notes is author comes at this from a place of healing and recovery not from a place of blame and I think it's important that the author starts off with this because um, like the point of the book is to help you kind of take your power back and help you in your individuation process and your own maturation process which was stunted and hurt by your narcissistic mother. However, once you've seen the light, once you start to understand how these patterns work and where your like mental health issues might come from and how they might be related to the abuse and the neglect, it's up to you as the adult to decide how to move forward with your life. And so if you continue to blame everything on your mother, like, oh, I, I never finished that degree because my mother was a narcissist, or oh, I never followed through with that plan because my mother is a narcissist, then that kind of turns into, it moves from healthy, you know, giving back responsibility, which is very important and healthy. Like, for example, I, you know, understand now where my own, a lot of my own mental health issues and emotional issues and my stunted individuation process, I now understand that and I place responsibility back on my parents because they're the ones who did this shit. They're the ones who fucked up. However, now that I understand these things, thanks to the books and the work that I've been, the books I've been reading and the work I've been doing throughout 2020, but for a very long time now. I'm the adult. I take responsibility for my decisions. I, I'm the one taking charge of my life and moving forward. I hope that makes sense. Um, so you're not taking responsibility for your parents' abuse. You place that responsibility onto them. However, to get stuck in this cycle of blame, it might just feed into self-sabotaging behavior. It might actually feed into some of the emotional immaturity you might be dealing with that you need to grow out of. And unfortunately, you have to do all this work of reparenting yourself, yourself, right? But it's up to you. You're the adult, right? And so that's the difference between responsibility and blame. Um, and I appreciate that she starts off right off the bat with that. Um, so the first part of the book, which is chapters one through five, 
is recognizing the problem. So chapters one through five are really all about diagnosing the problem, defining terms, uh, providing you an overview of what maternal narcissistic abuse looks like. So in chapter one, I wrote down a really great quote because I felt like the author was sharing her own, a little bit of her own experience because she was raised by a narcissistic mother and that's one of the reasons why she wrote this book. Um, but I felt like she was writing about my experience too. She says, and I don't have the page number, but this is in chapter one, the emotional burden you carry is the name of the chapter. Um, she's talking about the incessant toxic internal critic, which I've talked about in previous book review videos in this series. She says, these incessantly disapproving voices never gave me a moment's peace. They harangued, nagged, and demeaned me with the overall message that no matter how hard I tried, I could never succeed. I could never be good enough. They created such an extreme sensitivity in me that I constantly assumed others were judging me as critically as I was judging myself. And that is such a powerful quote, and I identify so much with that experience because that is very much how I internalized my mother's toxicity, how she weaponized toxic shame, how she constantly belittled me and called me stupid and told me that nothing I did was ever good enough, and how she also withheld empathy and emotional support and warmth from me from the time that I can remember. Um, how that can affect and cause this very toxic inner critic that you then project onto others and other relationships and fear that your self-loathing, like if you hate yourself basically at this level, then other people must be constantly critiquing and judging and hating you too. Like I, I reached that level. <laughs> I understand completely how that feels, completely. And now I understand where it comes from. So I can do the work to unpack this and place responsibility back on my mother and give the toxic shame and guilt back to her because I refuse to deal with it anymore, right? <laughs> um, she also def defines what maternal narcissism is and just very succinctly she says maternal narcissists are mothers who are so emotionally needy and self-absorbed that they are unable to give unconditional love and emotional support to their daughters short and sweet very simple um, and this book really helped me to understand the roots of where my mother's narcissism, narcissistic tendencies, narcissistic abuse, whatever you want to call it, where it comes from, and how it impacted how she behaved and interacted with us and abused us, me and my sister. And, you know, there's the great nature versus nurture debate. Maybe with people who have been diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder, maybe there's a, a, a nature component, maybe there's a genetic component, maybe there's something, you know, different about their brain structure. Lord knows. I, however, um, understand things more on the nurture end of the spectrum um, because I, you know, I've learned a little bit over the years about my mom's, um, how abusive her parents were and some of the traumatic things that she went through as a child and then as a young adult, you know, sexual abuse at the hands of her own father and her mother, who was also a narcissist, and her mother, who was very volatile and I think was probably an alcoholic and, you know, it, it makes sense that my mother is the way that she is. And basically, under this kind of nurture understanding of narcissism and how this can be a transgenerational problem, basically, if you have such narcissistic and or abusive parents, 
they severely damage your development. The development of your sense of self and your emotional development. And it's unfortunate that we live in a world where so many people think that those things aren't really important, <laughs> or at least they're not as important as your physical development, for, for example, or your intellectual development. It's, that's very unfortunate because they are just as important for a healthy, stable, well-rounded human being. But if you grow up with such abusive, traumatic parents, emotional development and the development of your very sense of self is severely damaged and stunted. And I cannot imagine what my mother went through because it seemed like it was pretty intense and I could see how that stuntedness, especially in her sense of self, led to her narcissistic abuse and behavior with us. Um, there's a point in the book, I think this is in chapter two, which is called The Empty Mirror. And this, this chapter really helped me to understand that. Um, the Empty Mirror, My Mother and Me. Um, where she says, a self-absorbed self mother has a vulnerable self-esteem which causes her to pro project her own self-hatred onto her daughter. And so if you have this under, underdeveloped or stunted or broken, whatever, sense of self, the result of that could be that you start to absorb other people into your self, sense of self. And so other people become so entangled in your own unmet emotional needs, your own self-loathing, that you start to project your self-esteem issues, your perfectionism, your insecurities onto others. And unfortunately, children, you know, I was a child. I, I had no way to defend myself against that. And it... You know, and the sad thing is, the sad truth is, my mother then, because her parents stunted and damaged her sense of self and her emotional development, my mother then also stunted and damaged my sense of self and my emotional development. And so this is how this thing keeps getting passed on and, and on and on and on until you become the cycle breaker. Um, but becoming the cycle breaker means you might have to face the fact that you might have internalized narcissistic tendencies yourself, which narcissism is not good or bad. It's uh, more a question of whether the narcissism is appropriately applied or not, right? Because there are times when it's actually healthy and appropriate to be more self-focused and self-centered and self-concerned, but there are other times when it's not so appropriate and it can actually be very damaging to you, to your relationships, to other people, right? Um, and that's actually something that the author talks about toward the end of the book, which I'll get to. But we're talking about chapter two, The Empty Mirror, My Mother and Me, that really helped me to understand my mother's emptiness that's the best way that I can put it, is like you're, you're a halfway developed person, you're an empty person. And how that emptiness feeds into this self-hatred and self-loathing that you then project onto others. My mother's perfectionism, because she had a lot of internalized perfectionism, she projected onto us and then told us that nothing we did was ever good enough because she felt that nothing she did was ever good enough. Her internalized toxic shame that she used to beat herself up all the time, she then projected onto us in incredibly toxic ways. I mean, my mother threatened, you know, I have a very intense memory, something that I actually consider pretty unforgivable because my mother took it to such an extreme that she became cruel. She was overtly cruel with us. Um, and she threatened to publicly shame me and humiliate me in order to coerce me to do whatever she wanted me to do. 
She had a lot of control issues, overstepping her boundaries. There were no boundaries. She was the center of the dysfunctional family unit. She controlled everything. It was, it was a very toxic environment to grow up in. Um, so she has in chapter two also 10 mother-daughter dynamics associated with maternal narcissism. And I'll just go over these quickly, but I put a check mark next to each one of these because I could think of specific examples that lined up with what the author was saying. So dynamic number one, you constantly try to please her, win her love, or gain her approval, but never feel able to succeed. Check. <laughs> oh, my mother's perfectionism that she dumped on us. Um, number two, your mother emphasizes the importance of how it looks to her rather than how it feels to you. A lack of empathy, um, everything, you know, everything has to do with her image of herself and how her children's behavior affects her image of herself and how she might be worried about like what the neighbors might think or what everybody else might think, right? Because of that lack of self-esteem, like it's her sense of self is so dependent on other people's approval, right? It doesn't come from within, it's dependent on other people's approval, so then she projects that on you and, you know, yeah, it's so damaging. Um, number three, your mother is jealous of you. Check. Number four, your mother does not support your healthy expression of self, especially when they conflict with her own needs or threaten her. Check. You're not allowed to express yourself. You're not allowed to have a, se a self because everything has to do with what she wants out of you, right? because you're kind of absorbed into her sense of self, so therefore you're not allowed to develop an independent self from her. Number five, in your family, it's always about mom. And good God, this is a daily thing growing up, you know, in childhood and in my teenage years. Whatever mood mom was in determined what your mood and how your day was gonna go. <laughs> And she made damn sure that she always got what she wanted out of you, even if it meant bullying you and being overtly cruel with you. Um, number six, your mother is unable to empathize. And I have, <laughs> I remember when I was in high school, and this goes back to even when I was a child, like from the time that I can remember, my mother never empathized with me. She never provided comfort for me. Like. You know, if I was a three or a four year old and I was running and I fell and I scraped my knee or something, my mother would never say like, oh, I'm so sorry, does that hurt? You have a boo-boo. You know, never got any of that from her. What I got was contempt, as if like she was pissed that she had to deal with it. And she would tell me like, I, how many times did I tell you not to do that? Now go clean up. And she would make me clean my own wounds as a very small child. And even in high school, I remember um, there was a time when I was having uh, pretty bad panic attacks that were producing like severe chest pain because I was overworked and I couldn't handle the pressure from her and academic pressure to be perfect and all that. And I was crying, begging to her like to let me make a change in my schedule or whatever. And she said, what's this Rachel, another pity party? So just like overt bullying to let you know that you were not going to get any empathy from her. And if you can't get empathy from your mother, it's a very lonely childhood. It's a very damaging kind of childhood. Um, point number seven, your mother can't deal with her own feelings. And my mother has had such severe emotional breakdowns, I don't even know how else to call it, that she has become violent at times. I have worried about my own physical safety at times. I have worried about her potentially hurting herself at times. And I've even had to call the cops on her because we thought she was becoming so violent, like throwing tables and threatening to punch my dad in the face and, you know, yeah. So, she has trouble regulating her own emotions to the extent that she starts to become violent. And she also regresses in her behavior and how she talks. She like 
becomes a six-year-old. Um, so that lack of emotional development is that it's so explicit with her. It's so explicit. <laughs> she starts talking like a six-year-old and acting like a six-year-old throwing a tantrum. Um, number eight, your mother is critical and judgmental and good God. You know, she constantly called me stupid. One of her, one of her favorite insults for me was to call me a dumb blonde because my hair is a lighter tone than other people in the family. She critiqued my physical appearance and basically made me feel ugly and too fat all the time. Um, she called me stupid all the time. Yeah, just overt verbal abuse. And your mother treats you like a friend, not a daughter. And in that um, wasn't Number nine, uh, your mother treats you like a friend, not a daughter. That has to do with like unhealthy role reversals. Your mother, your narcissistic mother might expect you to comfort her, which has happened. Um, I remember, I think when my mom finally um, admitted herself into the mental hospital and she was there for several weeks one time, I was the one who had to convince her to go. And I was, a, you know, I was in my early 20s, early to mid 20s at the time. And I, you know, that's an unhealthy role reversal for a child and a parent. It's not supposed to be that way. Um, and number 10, you have no boundaries privacy, or privacy with your mother. So a, a very common thing about narcissistic mothers is like, you're not allowed to shut your bedroom door. You're not allowed to lock your door. You're not allowed to have any privacy. Like these are the type of people who might barge in when you're in the middle of like taking a shit in the bathroom or they might walk right into the room while you're like half naked trying to get dressed, which sure, maybe if you're like a three-year-old, that's fine. But when you're, you know, a teenager, it's um, a another form of kind of abusive, intrusive, inappropriate behavior. And my mom has been very literal in some of those things growing up too. Like she had to be aware of what you were doing all the time. You weren't allowed any privacy. There were no boundaries whatsoever. Um, yeah, she went to great lengths to enforce that. So uh, those are the 10 mother-daughter dynamics that are common when you have a narcissistic mother. Moving on to chapter three, which is the faces of maternal narcissism. This is where she lists um, her kind of top six categories or forms of maternal narcissists. And there, of course, can be overlap in these categories. Um, she has the flamboyant extrovert, and that's, um, you know, when your narcissistic mother in social situations acts inappropriately to try to get attention on herself. That kind of flamboyant, over-the-top attention, needy attention-grabbing kind of inappropriate behavior. Uh, the accomplishment-oriented narcissistic mother, and good lord was that my mother, that's had to do with a lot of her perfectionism. Um, the psychosomatic narcissistic mother who uses pain or illness to manipulate others. And this is kind of because there are lots of mothers out there who deal with chronic illness and chronic pain and even mental illness. Um, you know, it, so there's a fine, there's like that fine line where we need to recognize that people dealing with these issues, right, deserve to spend time on their self-care and on themselves, and they need it for survival. We all do, but it's like, especially if you, you're dealing with a like chronic disease or an autoimmune issue or something like that. Um, however, that can turn into manipulative territory. It's kind of, that one is kind of like, mm, you know, that's one of those touchy things. That's one of those kind of uncomfortable things that needs to really be unpacked a lot. Um, so that's just something to be aware of. It might be kind of triggering for you. Um, so just be aware of that one. Um, you have the narcissistic mother dealing with addiction. 
um, the secretly mean narcissistic mother where their public face is very different from their private face and my mom was guilty of that too. I have an, a memory and this is such a clear, <laughs> just oh, e explicit example of this. My mother was screaming and yelling at all of us. I don't even remember why, but then the phone rang and it was someone from church. And I remember my mom just like doing a 180, like, phew, like she was screaming and yelling and being abusive with us. And then she picked up the phone. Oh, hi, Sharon, how are you? Like just, phew, you know, very explicit example of that. Um, and then the emotionally needy narcissistic mother and that's where the mother starts to do that inappropriate role reversal she starts to expect the child to take care of her and that's not appropriate and that kind of thing chapter four and this is a very important chapter um, where is daddy the rest of the narcissistic nest is the title of this chapter and I wrote down a few quotes which I found very um, appropriate and that applied very well to the dynamic between my domineering narcissistic mother and then my father who was complicit in all of it and allowed all of this bullshit to happen. So she said on page 60, the narcissist needs to be married to a spouse who will allow her to be at the center of all the action. That is how it has to be if the marriage is to survive. And whether or not it's healthy for the marriage to survive is a different thing. But if, like, the only way for that marriage to stay, like, to work, in terms of not work in a healthy way, but just to where, like, the partner doesn't give up on it and doesn't ask for a divorce or whatever, it's only if the partner, which is the father figure, if you had a mother and a father, um, if he puts up with it. But that's very dangerous and damaging for the children because the father then puts the survival of the marriage ahead of the emotional needs and safety of the children. Um, so another very pertinent quote, which sounds like she was talking about my mother and my father's dynamic on page 62. Um, the emotional health of daughters of narcissistic mothers is in effect sacrificed so that their father can keep the peace with his wife. And that's exactly what my dad did. And he did it, he, he took it from a, you know, just being complicit kind of level, and he took it right up to an abusive level where he was gaslighting us. Um, I, I have a memory when I was a teenager, and, you know, I was expressing and crying. I was expressing some pain and just, like, so frustrated with my mother, and I went to him expecting comfort, but my father also being an emotionally immature person, adult, he wasn't able to empathize, he just can't, that's, you know, he also comes from a very abusive and volatile background, so he's, he just can't, and he, he took it a step further though, because he said, Rachel, you should know how your mother is by now, why are you letting her get to you? As if the problem was with me, not with her. And that's the level or the extent to which he was willing to go in order to not have to deal with the problem. He just wasn't willing to deal with my mother. He wasn't willing to confront her. And he explicitly let us know, or let me know, that he wasn't willing to defend me from her. And so I was abandoned. Just completely, like, left to the wolves, basically. Just abandoned by him. So that chapter about um, how the narcissist will affect the family dysfunction and dynamics was very eye-opening and affirming and validating for me. Um, and then in chapter five, chapter five is image is everything, put a smile on that pretty little face is the title of the chapter. And this goes more into detail about the narcissistic mother's concern with appearance you know, how others judge or view the family or how she thinks others judge and view the family, but also um, the 
the importance for her of physical appearance and how the narcissistic mother might attack your physical appearance. Like my mother told me all the time that my chest was too flat and that my hips were too wide and she constantly attacked me anytime I gained weight. Um, she, yeah, she attacked my physical appearance all the time. Now, moving on to part two of the book. Part two is focused more on how narcissistic mothering how narcissistic mothering affects your entire life. So if part one was about diagnosing the problem and defining terms and things like that, this is more about, well, this is how this is still affecting you today. Even if you don't have a relationship with your maternal figure or mother, even if she died like 10 years ago, this is how your psyche and your own emotional health and your own sense of self was damaged by this shit. <laughs> So, chapter six is, I try so hard, the high achieving daughter, because um, McBride, the author, says that's kind of, in general, there's one or two ways that you can go with this. You can become the perfectionistic high achiever, or you can become the underachieving self-sabotager. Um, and, you know, you can be both of these things depending on the situation. And so I found the High Achieving Daughter um, chapter, chapter 6, I, I felt like I could identify a lot with what she was saying. Um, and she talks about imposter syndrome, for example, on page 93. High Achieving Daughters of Narcissistic Mothers are at great risk for imposter syndrome because we were raised to feel we were never good enough. When a woman does not feel worthy internally, she believes that she is underdeserving and cannot accept success or recognition. So, and I have a tarot spread that I shared recently about imposter syndrome. If you work with a tarot, I'll link it up here. But that's something that I've struggled with for a very long time, like over a decade, um, is imposter syndrome. And now I understand where it comes from. It's my mother's narcissistic abuse. Um, Chapter seven is what's the use, the self-sabotaging daughter. So that's the, the other side of this high achieving perfectionistic imposter syndrome, but then also the underachieving self-sabotaging kind of behavior. And then chapter eight is romantic fallout, trying to win at love where I failed with mom. And this is where she really talks about the effect of maternal narcissistic abuse on, on your future romantic partnerships or relationships with people and how you might have a tendency, and I know I did, especially in my 20s, in my friendships but also in my romantic partnerships, I had a tendency to repeat the abusive behavior because it was all I knew. It's what my mother conditioned me to know and she kind of conditioned me to be codependent like the, the doormat. She conditioned me to be a doormat because she made me into her doormat, <laughs> you know? Um, so that's what chapter eight was about. And that's also where she talks, um, w the critique I had of the book at the beginning of the review, that's where she kind of talks about everything in terms of monogamous and heteronormative terms, which is unfortunate, but that, that's really prominent in chapter eight. Chapter nine is help, I'm becoming my mother, daughters as mothers, and this is where, I think I alluded to this earlier, this is where you really need to do the soul searching and realize um, where you might have um, some narcissistic, like inappropriately used narcissistic traits of yourself, within yourself. Um, she also talks about, though, that um, you know, just trying to be the opposite of your mother doesn't isn't necessarily helpful either, and that's kind of a a pitfall that I put myself into. You know, I always said like I don't want to be anything like my mother, but that it's she she talks more about finding the middle ground. Like, identify the specific characteristics and behaviors of your narcissistic mother that for sure were pathological and abusive and harmful 
right? However, there might be other aspects to your mother, other lessons you learned from her, other types of behaviors that weren't so pathological and damaging. Um, she says, and this is paraphrasing, the middle ground you find, in the middle ground you find ultimately needs to be based on your value systems and beliefs, and that can include some of your mother's beliefs or some of the things you, the lessons she taught you, like maybe she taught you Sure, she was abusive and perfectionistic and incredibly damaging, but maybe the silver lining might be you have an incredible work ethic, or maybe you're very dedicated, or for example, my mother made me into a codependent doormat, but now, you know, 10 plus years removed from that, from those situations in my early 20s especially and in my teenage years, um, now I can kind of, in a more healthy way, with healthy boundaries and limits and practicing the ability to say no to people and all that, but I can also, I can also be a great listener. I can also be generous still with people, those kind of things. Um, she says, and this is again paraphrasing, it's easy to pass along a dysfunction when we think we're doing exactly the opposite of how we were abused. Like, there are blind spots to just trying to be the opposite or rejecting everything from your mother. Which I'm, I'm sure there are cases where the abuse and the pathology and the neglect were so extreme and bad enough that yes, it's actually healthy to reject all of it. But if you're not in that super duper far extreme, right, then maybe a little something a little bit closer towards the middle ground might be might save you from some of the pitfalls and blind spots of just trying to be the opposite or rejecting all of it right um, and having compassion for my mother and understanding where she comes from and why she is the way she is helps me to inch my way a little bit closer to that middle ground it doesn't mean i accept what she did it doesn't mean i excuse what she did mm -mm. uh-uh no way. I give her responsibility for her damaging behavior. Um, but there are things that I learned from her that I actually appreciate. That I still have chosen to keep and incorporate into my sense of self. Um, another thing that I really appreciate in this chapter about help on becoming my mother when daughters become mothers. And I, I found this helpful and I'm not a mother. Not yet, anyway. Um, that's a whole other topic for a different day. But I found this helpful, too, just to learn about, and she talks about in this chapter, so what, what makes a good enough mother? What, what does a relatively healthy, empathetic mother do? What does that look like? And she talks about how important empathy is and how empathy, according to the author, and I agree with her on this, Empathy is the most important parenting skill in terms of the child's development of self and um, emotional health. Like healthy, well-balanced, well-executed empathy is incredibly important. And she talks about what a healthy mother-daughter dynamic looks like and what healthy self-care as a mother looks like, which is really important because, you know, there's so many patriarchal expectations for mothers to be completely self-sacrificing, which is not healthy either. And then part three, ending the legacy, specific recovery steps for daughters of narcissistic mothers. And this is um, the part where it's more, it's most explicitly about recovery. Like, here's what you can do. Right? So chapter 10 is the first steps, how it feels, not how it looks. And this is reclaiming your emotions and your right to feel your emotions and your right to expect empathy from others. And she talks about really the importance of um, accept acceptance in this third part of the book. I can't remember exactly which chapter it was. But she talks about the stages of grief and how important grief work is and how it's, it's not something that you can skip. 
you cannot skip the emotional unpacking of grief. You need to grieve your shitty childhood. You need to grieve the fact that your mother is incapable of empathy and the type of love and emotional support that you needed. You need to grieve that loss. You can't skip that step. And she talks a lot about that. She talks a lot about acceptance too. She kind of plays around with this idea of the five stages of grief and she kind of flips it around and she says that acceptance is actually the place where you need to start in order to go through this grieving process. You need to realize your mother's limitations. You need to let go of unrealistic expectations from your mother. Um, that's part of that acceptance work that you really need to start with, or at least that's what the author says. Um, an, important uh, an important aspect about grieving is the role of other people in your grief work. Because sometimes when you're dealing with healing from narcissistic parental abuse in general, you might get pushback from people. You might get people who gaslight you and tell you, ah, it wasn't that bad, what are you complaining about? You might get other family, even immediate family members who might tell you that you're being you're being dramatic or you're being selfish or whatever. And um, she says it's important not to listen to other people who are doing that to you, who are telling you those sorts of things because they will get in the way of your healing and you need to prioritize your healing and your recovery work. She says if you ignore grief out of fear or because you listen to other people's opinions, your recovery will not work. That's on page 148. Grief is the most important step of recovery. Um, she talks a little bit about inner child work, um, eye movement, desensitization and reprocessing or EMDR and how that might be helpful in therapy and recovery. Um, and then in chapter one, or chapter 11, a part of and a part from, which is separating your sense of self from your mother, she talks about the individuation process. She says, the individuation process is stunted for children of narcissistic mothers because she, your mother, has either engulfed or ignored this process in you. You're your need for individuation. It's just, it's a basic human right to individuate. It's so important. Um, so she talks about what you can do, what does separation mean, and she talks about pretty explicitly the option to cut your mother out of your life, which is super taboo in many parts, most parts of the world probably, but for some people it saves them. And it's, it should be seen as a valid, healthy option, right? Which I appreciate. Um, and then she has some exercises, especially in this third part of the book, that help you to journal about uh, the negative messages and internalized negative core beliefs you might have and how you can process them. Um, and then what separation, separating your sense of self from your mother, what that looks like. Chapter 12, Becoming the Woman I Truly Am. Uh, she, she talks about what, more about what this process might look like, how you might have some rough spots along the way, which she calls the collapse. And these are moments where your, your ego might get defensive or you might have a narcissistic moment yourself and how to impact that and how to like remember where this comes from so you can continue with your healing. Um, she has an exercise called your I am list where you list down like all the things that you are, all your, what you believe are your positive characteristics, how you choose to identify yourself. You know, I wrote down I am strong, I am brave, I am intelligent, I am empathetic, dot, dot, dot. And in this chapter on page 173, this is the exercise in the book that stuck out the most to me. If I were good enough, exercise. 
And this is basically um, a tool to help you realize how your negative and limiting core beliefs about yourself or about life in general might still be getting in the way. And so she basically says, you know, take a piece of paper, your journal, whatever, and write down, if I were good enough, comma, I would dot dot dot. And I wrote down, if I were good enough, I would become a teacher and a research professor. If I were good enough, I would build up my YouTube channel. If I were good enough, I would, you know, write this kind of a book that I've always wanted to write, blah, blah, blah. And basically, this helps you to see, like, it helps you to kind of sit back and reflect, wait a minute, why don't I think that I'm good enough to do these things? And that was an incredibly eye-opening exercise for me. Incredibly eye-opening. You know, I suggest, even if you're not going to purchase and read this book, just write down, if you feel like you have an issue with a toxic inner critic and limiting and negative core beliefs about yourself or life or whatever, write down, if I were good enough, comma, I would, you know, and then make a list of all the plans and things you would do if you believed that you were good enough to do them. And then sit back and ask yourself, why don't I think I'm good enough to do all these things? Very eye-opening. Very, it's so simple, but it's very eye-opening. Um, and then she talks more about um, different kind of exercises to help your individuation process and separate your sense of self from your mother. And then chapter 13, which is called My Turn, Dealing with the Mother During Recovery. And this is how you can kind of navigate that relationship. And I think actually it's in this chapter where she talks about that um, cutting your mother out of your life is an option. And she gives different um, ideas and ways that you can kind of lessen your exposure to your toxic mother. You know, there's temporary separation, there's setting boundaries, um, there's cutting your mother out of your life completely if that's what you choose to do. She also talks about, well, what if your mother has already passed away? What if she's already dead? And how that healing process will be um, a little bit different than if your mother is still alive. And then in chapter 14, filling the empty mirror, ending the narcissistic legacy. And this is, you know, being that cycle breaker. Um, and she, again, mentions that this work is kind of hard because you need to face some limitations within yourself in terms of your own misapplied or pathological narcissistic tendencies or whatever. Um, but she says, identifying your own, and this is on page 205, identifying your own narcissistic traits and working on them is responsible and self-nurturing and it proves that you are taking yourself and your recovery seriously. So don't let the toxic shame kick in whenever you kind of catch yourself in an argument with a partner or with your child or with someone at work or like having that kind of like Ugh, feeling don't let the toxic shame kick in. Don't start beating yourself up. Just, you know, in a non-judgmental way, acknowledge it. Think about how you can fix it because you are taking this seriously. You are nurturing and healing yourself. It's not an excuse to let your inner critic back in and start beating yourself up about it because that'll just be counterproductive. She talks about how important empathy is, accountability, entitlement, values, and like things that you can do to, if you do choose to have children, what you need or what you can teach them to make sure that this shit ends here. And um, yeah, I, I know I went more into detail about this book, but this book was very helpful and um, I hope that if you are searching for books about narcissistic mothers, and this is specifically about the mother-daughter dynamic, I, I hope that you find this book as helpful as I did. I think it was very validating, and it helped me to, in a compassionate way, um, 
but in a self-nurturing way, feel comfortable labeling my mother's abuse as narcissistic, and it helped me to begin the recovery and the healing process. And it was a great segue into the next book, which I'm going to talk about, which is Pete Walker's book about uh, complex PTSD. So, yeah, um, please share your thoughts and your experiences and your comments down below. And until next time, many blessings. Bye.